record and we are good. All right, guys, we are going to get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to session nine out of 10 um, on our CE lecture series uh, during the uh, COVID shutdown. Um, tonight is a very exciting topic that we've been waiting a long time to premiere. Tonight's topic is called Tongue Ties and Beyond, How One Tiny Little String Can Create a Lifetime of Problems. Um, so I'm going to jump in and kind of introduce our speakers uh, for the night, but first, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we are uh, nine tenths of our way through our lecture series. It's been a fantastic lecture series so far. Um, thank you to all the, the amazing speakers we've had, all the guest lectures that have logged in. And of course, to all of you guys out there, all the attendees, um, the doctors out there, um, the hygienists out there, all the providers out there who are taking their time to learn on hopefully some topics that uh, can give them some real um, some real kind of action items to uh, look forward to, to talking to their patients about when they get back in their office. Um, so uh, tonight is on tongue ties. And then Thursday, we have our very own Lauren Reinholdt, um, my functional therapist and former dental hygienist who will be speaking on um, the oxygen advantage and the healing power of proper breathing. She will be going over the butico breathing um, technique and method. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. Um, so here's the two flyers for that. If you haven't signed up for the one on Thursday, um, please do so. We have moved uh, time slots uh, due to the amount of kind of overwhelming um, amount of providers who reached out to us and said, hey, we're back at work. Is there any way you can make it a later time? So we did, we did just that. We tried to pull, push it back so we could accommodate everybody's schedules so everybody wouldn't miss um, these valuable um, uh, CE lectures. Uh, for all of you who um, are not able to watch this uh, live, you can always um, view any of our previously recorded uh, lectures via our YouTube channel, Pain and Sleep Therapy Center. Um, of course, we are actually live streaming right now on Facebook as well, and we will have the recordings up on our Facebook page, Pain and Sleep Therapy Center. And of course, if everybody um, wants to follow along with what we're doing, always uh, feel free to, to log in and follow us on Instagram page. Um, so I'm going to get started. So teamwork makes the dream work. That's kind of the, uh, the theme in our office. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to work with such a dedicated and passionate group of, um, a group of people. And so, you know, tonight I'm featuring uh, three of uh, the, the top providers um, that I get to work with on a daily basis, um, uh, whether it be Lauren, um, Dr. Joanna Green, or Leah. Um, it, we have really formed quite a, uh, a team. Uh, I, I like to think of ourselves as an airway team. Tonight we are featuring more of our tongue tie team. So I'm excited to kind of introduce everybody and hear what everybody has to say. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I have uh, dedicated my life after dental school to learning how to treat people who suffer from pain, how to suffer, who suffer from headaches, who suffer from TMD, and who suffer from airway disorders. Um, with that um, knowledge and dedication towards my education, it has driven me into all sorts of different paths, uh, pediatrics being a big one of them that I try and focus on a lot. Uh, today, tongue ties being one of the natural kind of next things that was um, something that I was really interested to learn about. So um, looking forward to, you know, speaking on some of my case studies tonight after um, Dr. Green goes um, and, and Leah and they talk about our infant program, Lauren and I will be jumping in and we will be talking about sort of the older adults um, and the kid, the uh, older children program that we have as well. Um, so uh, uh, one uh, one um, of our panelists, one of our guest lecturers tonight that I want to um, introduce is uh, Lauren, as you guys have probably heard me, me say, and uh, all the other webinars we've been a part of, I get the pleasure to work with Lauren on just about every single patient. I had the, the privilege to work with her while I was in general dentistry, while she was the hygienist and I was doing general dentistry. Um, she has transitioned with me to the pain and sleep therapy center. She is such a great resource. Uh, I wouldn't be anywhere near as successful as I am without her. So um, Lauren, if you don't mind, uh, can you just give us a brief little introduction of yourself and just to say hi so everybody knows who you are? Hi everyone, my name's Lauren. I work at the Pain and Sleep Therapy Center located in Delaware. I was a dental hygienist for 15 years prior to becoming an oral facial myofunctional therapist and a licensed Botica practitioner. 
I had my training through the IAOM with Sandra Hoffman, Patrick McEwen for Botega Breathing, Dr. Stephen Olmos, Crystal Robinson, and the Myofunctional Research Company for Myobrace. <clears throat> oh, and then if you want to connect with me, uh, you can connect with me on Facebook at Lauren at Pain and Sleep Center, Instagram, laurenr.omt, and then, or you could email me at lauren at painandsleepcenter.com. Awesome. We will be hearing a little bit more from Laura, Lauren in just uh, a little bit. Um, next up is uh, Leah. She is the newest addition to our office. We are super excited to have um, Leah, who is um, has a kind of a different background than what we're used to in the dental um, dental industry. She is a speech language pathologist. Um, she has we've been working with her for a few years, uh, both uh, professionally and personally. So I'll let her just introduce herself real quick, and I can tell you, probably out of all of us, she's got the coolest the coolest kind of stories in the world with her kids and her experience into this um, airway world and kind of why she's working with us. But I'll let her give herself just a little introduction. Leah, are you there? I am. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Leah Heckman. I am a speech language pathologist and a certified lactation counselor. Um, I just started, like Dr. Robinson said, at the Pain and Sleep Therapy Center. I also work at Christiana Care Health System, and I've worked at Easter Seals in the past. Um, and I work in a variety of settings, in the NICU, um, early intervention, so those kiddos that are birthed to age three, and in the outpatient setting, so school-age kids. <clears throat> and then this is my lovely family. The photo in the center was this past weekend. We had a porch uh, first birthday for my youngest daughter, Josie. Um, so people um, drove through and got a piece of cake. Um, so we mm -hmm. had a good time doing that. Um, the picture on the left is of my son, Jack. Um, and he's there in the dental chair, giving some thumbs up for his myofunctional therapy session. Um, and then the kiddo on the right is Josie. Um, and she's showing her great lingual extension there. Um, mm -hmm. But like Dr. Robinson said, uh, both my kiddos had lip and, and tongue ties. So this is a topic that's very personal uh, to me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leah. We'll hear from you in just a little bit. And then finally, I'm going to kind of uh, hand the reins over to Dr. Joanna Green. Um, here we are at the open house for the Pain and Sleep Therapy Center. Um, Dr. Joanna Green has... Um, come a long way with us over the years. Um, she started off as more of kind of a cosmetic dentist and um, we've kind of, uh, her and I have, have kind of transitioned into this whole entire airway world, um, phrenectomy world, tongue ties, um, and the influence that that can have on growth and development. So I couldn't be more proud of her. She has literally dedicated herself to this infant phrenectomy program. She is extremely talented. Um, she has been all across the country traveling, learning from um, the best. I mean, I hands down think that she has uh, one of the absolute top programs in the entire country. People drive hours to see her. So I couldn't be more proud to um, be having her as one of the guest lecturers tonight and, and to be able to call her up, uh, not, not just a, a partner um, in business, but she has become a, uh, a genuine friend of mine. Um, our kids hang out all the time and all that. Um, so she is a pleasure to work with every day. So with that, I'm going to share my, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Joanna and she's going to take control of host here. Joe, you got it? All right. Let's see. How's that looking? That is looking good. You might have to like click on it though. Yep, there you go. There you go, okay. All right, well, thank you so much um, for the introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here tonight, um, really speaking from the heart with a lot of this because um, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience tonight have been through this and um, it's just a very interesting topic. It's a hot topic. Um, and we can all learn a lot from it. And um, <clears throat> it's just very interesting to learn how from birth, we can influence the trajectory of someone's life. So 
and um, hopefully this lecture will kind of clarify some things for you all um, and kind of shed some knowledge on um, ways that we can intervene at an early age so we can have the best outcomes for our babies and children and then ultimately as adults. Um, like Ryan said, he's going to speak about um, some of the pediatrics and adults, um, but I'm going to focus on the infants um, for today. So um, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, so my name is Joanna Green. Um, I am a general dentist um, and I really, I started um, about 10 years ago and I practiced um, in your typical private practice um, and then really um, transitioned to um, the pain and sleep center where I'm working um, side by side with Dr. Robinson. So I'm still doing both, but I'm, st I'm starting to gear towards more full time at the pain and sleep center. So I'm really excited to be doing that because our program has truly become really successful. Um, and as the word gets out and um, people will learn about the quality of care that we have, um, I'm just becoming um, busier and busier and we're just adding more and more um, tools to our tool belt so that we can help our um, infants and children and adults. So I've had a lot of training um, <clears throat> and a lot of infants um, specific training. Um, so basically all over the country kind of traveling and, and learning um, all the techniques and the best providers. So um, it's something that I love doing. I love CE and I love um, just learning new techniques. So we take a breathing. Um, I took some of those courses with Lauren. Um, lots of courses on phrenectomy, growth and development, um, airway education. We're gonna get into some pediatric expansion. Um, so we have a lot of really exciting things um, that we have going on at the Pain and Sleep Center. And so, um, usually I look like that, but with quarantine, I'm starting to feel like I'm looking like Charlie's on the right here, chasing my kids around. So I have three kids, um, two toddlers, age three and five. I'm going to introduce them. And I just had a baby um, literally uh, one month ago. Um, and you'll learn more about his story at the end of the lecture because um, I, um, as a mother, did his uh, phrenectomy release. So that was interesting to say the least. All right, so the Pain and Sleep Center, um, you'll see on the left here, that's me with Dr. Robinson. Um, he's been a great mentor, friend, um, partner in all of this. Um, he's constantly um, pushing me to be better at what I do. And so if you're comfortable, you're not learning. So I like to um, think of that as a way to um, really keep propelling myself in the profession. And so the more we learn about adults, we're also learning about um, infants and how everything is interconnected. So it's truly a great partnership and a friendship. Um, the middle picture here is, these are my two main assistants. So we have Carrie on the left, she's my lead assistant, and then Marissa is on the right. And these ladies have been with me um, the entire time um, from the beginning of the program um, uh, at our days at the Pike Creek Dental Office. Um, they've helped me develop all of my forms and intake and bounce ideas off them. Um, so those ladies are really um, inspirational. They're such hard workers and um, they have been, like I said, they've been there with me from uh, day one and so I'm very thankful for them. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Marissa. Um, and then there's, this is a picture of the office. Um, we have really strived to make the Pain and Sleep Center a non-dental setting. It's relaxing, um, calm, peaceful environment. It's quiet. It's just totally different from a dental office. And um, the parents appreciate it. The babies, they don't say much about it, but I know they like it. Um, but it's, it's been so nice to work in a different setting and it really sets us apart from other practices. Um, we started at Pike Creek Dental kind of um, doing them out of a dental chair. And um, this is just a, a game changer and it's been, it's been uh, really nice to have. So <clears throat> um, what I've learned is that I still have a lot to learn. I love this quote because it truly um, shows how we have to um, keep learning, collaborate, um, take CE, get your hands on whatever you can. 
um, and never stop learning. All right, and then these are my two girls. And this is a wonderful day. I've never seen this day before. Love that quote too, Maya Angelou. Um, in the midst of all this COVID stuff, um, just be thankful for every day that you have. Because if you have health, you have wealth. And so what we um, strive to do at the Pain Sleep Center is kind of um, be the backbone of that. All right, so my story. Um, so we have little Miss Stella here on the left. So she was my preemie baby at 35 weeks. I had a difficult time breastfeeding her. Um, I sought lactation help at the hospital, um, but it was kind of messy. Had a lot of different hands in the pot, um, a lot of different opinions. <clears throat> And every time I went there, it was something different. It was just overwhelming as a first time mom. Um, and I really, it made me frustrated. And I, can, I, I know that's what a lot of moms are going through at this time when they come and see me. Um, and so part of what I do is try to minimize that. Uh, if I can refer them to, the, to my team, the people that I know will do a, a good job of guiding them. Um, because I don't want people to go through what I went through. Because we know that uh, mothers that are not successful when they set goals to breastfeed, when they're not successful in that, they have a higher um, rate of postpartum depression. I went through that. It was pretty miserable when you're going crazy trying to feed your four pound baby, um, obsessing over ounces. Um, so we tried to really make, make a a smooth transition and have a good team on our side. All right, so fast forward two years later, I had my second daughter and that's Fiona in the middle. So she was full term and eight pounds, so quite a different birth story than my first. Um, and she's actually what, what uh, started all of this for me. Um, so I was nursing her around the clock, which was pretty normal, but after a month or two, um, I decided to start Googling, you know, like what was going on. I'd heard some things here and there. Um, and I ended up going to the birth center. And those ladies are wonderful. And um, actually when I called their office, um, I spoke to Gwen. She's one of the IBCLCs there. And she answered the phone and, and I told her my story. And I was like, well, I just want to get an assessment because my daughter does not have a tongue tie. I'm a dentist. I would know if she had a tongue tie. Um, but I still want to come in, but I'm just letting you know. And so I still laugh about that because it just truly shows how I, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and I ended up seeing uh, one of the IBCLCs there and she um, identified, she listened to me um, and she, it wasn't just a visit, it was more like meeting with a friend. And so it was a really great experience. Um, and I think that's what a lot of moms need is not just um, sit down, let me talk at you, but they want someone to listen to them. Um, and so that's what our IBCLCs and our SLPs, CLCs, LCs, um, they're good at listening to moms and getting that story, figuring out what's going on with the baby um, and their, their journey in that. So um, basically, um, so once Fiona was identified as having a tongue and a lip tie, um, we had the revision done. And it was that process that kind of um, started everything for me. So I said, I can do this as a mother and as a dentist, but I can do it in a way that makes me feel comfortable. Um, and I basically, I built a program from the ground up, um, encompassing everything that I wanted um, that I thought a mom should have um, from both, like I said, from a mother and a provider's perspective. So that was a really cool thing to be able to do. And then my um, third child, this is Dalton, our boy. Um, my, my husband was super excited about that. Um, so I will go into his story at the end of the presentation. Um, but yes, I did um, a labial and a lingual release on him um, just two and a half weeks ago. So uh, you'll learn a little bit more about that. All right, and so these are my girls now. Um, fast forward, like I said, they're um, almost three, almost five. And this is my family, <clears throat> there's my husband. So I have to give him a big thank you because he's always 
keeping the kids at bay, keeping my wine glass filled up when I'm working late at night on these presentations. Um, and you can see how smitten my daughters are with the new baby. And then on the right is baby Dalton. And he's just laying covered up with baby dolls. All right. <clears throat> oh yeah, and then there's Murphy. He's our ire setter. Can't forget about him. All right, so today's objectives, um, what today is not, it's not about the phrenectomy procedure. So I'm not here to talk about where to aim the laser, how deep to cut. Um, this is about the why behind everything. So it's the why, it's the process, it's some literature, um, all those other things, um, the actual procedure itself, um, that's for another time and day, okay? So we're gonna learn about the, the tongue a little bit, um, our approach to care, why we care so much, and then I'll go over Dalton's case at the end. All right, so um, <clears throat> the tongue does a lot of different things, and we're gonna go through uh, pretty much all of these points here, and I'm going to um, describe how it's, um, how everything is interrelated with um, tongue ties, okay? All right, so the tongue, um, <clears throat> four intrinsic muscles, four extrinsic muscles on each side. So that makes a total of 16 muscles that work together bilaterally in a complex fashion. All right, um, other fun facts is that the tongue is a muscular hydrostat, um, which is, like a um, octopus tentacle, it's the same thing. So it's muscle working with muscle to actually move it around. Um, and um, so extrinsic muscles are the ones that basically they attach to uh, bony structures and move the tongue within and out of the mouth while the intrinsic muscles, they're the different muscles inside the tongue that change the shape and orientation of the tongue. And a fun fact about the tongue is that um, there are studies about using the tongue for um, like authentication systems, um, just like they do like eye scanners and fingerprints because no two tongues are alike. So they're even different in identical twins. And there's that tentacle. All right, so what is a frenum? Um, so the newest definition of a frenum is that it is a midline fold in a layer of fascia. All right, so one of the first things that I tell parents is that everyone has a frenum. Um, our job as clinicians is to distinguish between a pathologic frenum and a functional or normal frenum, okay? Um, because parents, you'll see, and they go online, they're like, look at this thing, my kid has it, I need to get rid of it. No, this is about distinguishing what's causing a problem from a functional aspect, all right? So that means identification, assessment, diagnosis. Um, and so going back to this fascial plane, um, it is very important to have this team approach. So one of our team members is a um, cranial sacral therapist and as you guys may know they they work with fascia um, so myofascial release and that's when it's really beneficial to have these babies um, manipulated by these therapists um, because it can help it can help stretch things out um, it can uh, calm the nervous system there's a lot of benefits that it has to it but it just goes to show that there is I mean this is a fascial restriction um, and there's different classifications of that, and I'll go into that. All right, so what is fascia? Uh, that is a complex answer as well. Um, the bottom line, it is, um, think of fascia as the pith around a orange. So it circles outside the orange, but then in between each segment, it covers it. It's that white covering. So we have this, a similar thing in our bodies. It, it covers all of our muscles. It, groups individual uh, muscle strands and then it, it groups the actual muscle bundles together it's between all of the organs um, it is this it's a white um, connective tissue matrix so but there's different kinds of it um, 
And it's all made by, um, it's basically made of extracellular cell matrix, ECM. So um, it's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, there's a lot of different, um, there's not a lot of hard research on it, um, but there's a lot of things online about it um, and the benefits that um, having properly functioning fascia, um, the benefits um, for overall health. So the deep frontal plane um, is basically, um, this shows a dissection of the deep frontal plane, which is a single piece of fascia that was dissected. And it, you can see on the top there, it, um, it shows the tongue. And it's one piece that connects the tongue to the tip of the toes. So everything is interconnected. And that's why it can be really beneficial to have a cranial sacral therapist or a chiropractor that does manipulations um, for babies um, and like fascial releases to help uh, get everything moving and flowing. Okay, so what is a tongue tie? The bottom line is that you have to understand normal to, to then understand what is pathologic, okay? Um, so like this picture shows, if you weren't looking for it, you probably wouldn't see it. Um, you're going to go to your pediatrician. They're probably not going to look for it. Um, as a parent, you may not see it, but if you retract the tongue, then you start to see this thick um, midline structure there. And you're like, what the heck is that? Is this what's causing these issues? Um, sometimes it doesn't cause any issues. So that's part of the process. Um, a study in 2000 estimated that new, the newborn prevalence of tongue ties is about 4.8%. That, well, that was a long time ago, so I think it's higher now. Um, the bottom line is that uh, we're looking at a pathologic frenum. It's not about having it, it's when it causes issues. So we want a functional assessment by a, tri uh, a trained provider. <clears throat> All right, so Frenums. What is normal anatomy uh, versus restriction? So you, you're not only going to look at appearance, um, but you have to have a functional assessment, history, and symptoms. So a proper exam, that's the lighting, that's the positioning of your body. It's not about sticking a tongue blade in someone's mouth and, and kind of being like, oh, it's there, it's not there. It's, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, it's a good start, I guess, but it shouldn't be the end-all be-all of your diagnosis. So one of the things I really preach to the providers is that if you're not trained in it, what we want you to do, what you should be doing really is saying, hey, I hear that you're having a problem um, or um, your baby's going through this. Um, so let me send you to to someone who's an expert in this. Um, let me send you to the specialist that can um, really take a, a good look at what's going on here, hear what, you're, what you have to say um, and take a proper look uh, instead of saying no. Because more often than not, that's what I hear. Um, certain providers will just say, no, that's not a tongue tie. But the baby does actually have a functional restriction. It may not be a tongue tie in the sense that it is the tip of the tongue that is tied, but um, as you'll learn, there's different um, classifications and they can all have really detrimental effects. So looking at these pictures, um, you'll see on the top left, <clears throat> this baby's upper lip is, um, what I'm seeing here, when I look at it, I see a lip blister, a lip blister that has now a scab on it. Okay, you see blanching there. That picture below it, that, that patient, that was the tongue of the patient. Um, and that was an anterior tongue tie. So sometimes these get identified at the hospital, sometimes they don't. Um, <clears throat> but usually providers um, will be able to look at an anterior tongue tie and say, that's a tongue tie. So those are kind of super easy to, to um, identify. That middle picture, that's that's one that you're not going to see unless you're lifting up the patient's tongue and you can see that cord is is thicker as compared to the one on the right which is thinner so they have different presentations there's different things that we look for whether it's um blanching like in particular for the upper lip whether it's blanching um how thick um how corded it is what the nose like if it's um flaring over the nostrils 
um, and I'll get into that a little bit later. All right, so how are tongue ties found? Uh, typically, you're a doctor, a nurse, um, nurse practitioner, a lactation consultant at the hospital, um, OBs at follow up appointments, they'll ask moms, a good OB will ask, how is nursing going? Um, are you breastfeeding? How are you feeding your baby? Are you breastfeeding? Are you bottle feeding? Um, so I just had a baby a month ago. So I, I literally just went through what happened at the hospital and the care that I got there. And so once you leave that hospital, no one's looking out for you. No one's calling you and saying, Hey, how are you doing? Is your baby eating? Um, how is your, you know, so there's a big, a big portion of that that's that's missed and I really feel like it's um it's really essential to have pre um pre-birth um education on um figuring out how you're gonna feed your baby and things to look out for. But um an OB is a, a great way to identify like a tongue tie or at least a problem, a suspected tongue tie. Pediatricians um at at follow-up appointments at their um, you know, three day appointment, one week, one month appointment, just ask them the question, hey, how are you doing? How is your baby feeding? Um, are you having any pain? Um, how, and then everything's kind of revolving around weight gain. Weight gain is not the end all be all of how your baby's doing because so many mothers will be um, nursing with their nipples severely damaged or they're just you know, someone told them it's, it's supposed to hurt, like this is normal. So um, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. Um, another way that um, tongue ties are identified is through the internet. So we know that nursing moms um, have a lot of, uh, they typically have one hand free and that's on their cell phone. And so once they start having issues, they're going to Dr. Google they're looking at Facebook groups and all these things can, can be really great at um, kind of getting the ball rolling, but it's important to make sure that um, you're seeing the right uh, care before and during and after your phrenectomy. Okay. You can't take it all, can't take it all for medical advice. You have to actually see the professionals. All right. <clears throat> so I made this flow chart. This is our multidisciplinary team approach. So, Starting um, over here um, on the left hand side, the pediatrician, you have your OB, NP, or your friend to ask those important questions. And then you're going to um, find your way to an IBCLC or an SLP um, or a, a provider, a release provider. So that could be an ENT, it could be a dentist, it could be a pediatrician sometimes. Um, and that is for the, the actual evaluation and diagnosis. Um, in, intermingled in there, you could have body work, chiropractic. So that's, we're talking about that fascia. So a, a lot of the times I will send, I will see babies and I will send them for therapy before I release them if I feel like the timing is not correct. Um, a lot of the times the lactation counselors will send the babies for body work first before they even see me because they want to get that baby in prime uh, mode to be treated. All right. Um, so once, once you have like everything set up um, in the ideal fashion, then you go to the, re the release provider and you actually have the procedure done. Um, after that, we send the babies back to the referral, which is to, like if they're seeing lactation um, for a wound check, and that's usually between three and five days. Really important because A, um, to actually check the healing, make sure there's no reattachment, but to support the mom and make sure that nursing or feeding the baby, bottle feeding um, is going well, um, you know, and being there to support her mentally uh, and physically. Then the baby might go back for body work. Uh, then the baby might go back to lactation. Um, and then the baby ultimately in my office comes back and sees me at two weeks because I want to see the work that I did. I want to see how the parents are doing their home care. Um, I want to see how the baby is faring. And so when we follow up, I had the parents um, do a whole um, new questionnaire about, and it basically compares what they came in with, um, signs and symptoms, to how they're doing at two weeks. And so I'm able to um, talk to talk them through like things that might get a little bit worse, like gas or reflux commonly get worse 
in the beginning because the tongue is all over the place and the baby's swallowing air. Um, so a lot of it is just um, some counseling for the parents and reassuring them because it's a, it's a tough time. So, um, and I also see every baby again because um, you're only going to have a 100% success rate if you never see that baby again. And so it's, it's really important to follow up and have parents come back to see you so that you can see how the baby's doing, uh, recommend more um, care, whether that's going back to lactation um, or going back for body work, et cetera. Um, so you just have to evaluate the situation at that point and lead them in the right direction. So how do we do functional assessments? So for infants, we take into consideration function, history and symptoms, compensations, and then appearance. So we kind of take all this um, together. Uh, for adults, we also look at all those things, but it's a little bit of a different process using different um, braiding scales, et cetera. Um, now for the babies, um, Leah is going to, she's gonna talk about that. So that will be part of her lecture um, right after mine. So. Um, because I want you guys to hear it from, from the speech language pathologist and um, lactation counselor, what she does, um, because she is the expert in feeding, okay? I, I do this when I need to do it, um, and I do parts of this for every baby, but I want every single baby to see someone like Leah, to see a IBCLC, because they're the feeding experts and they, they do a lot. So she's going to go into detail about all of this. And then um, Dr. Robinson is going to talk about adults at the end. All right, so um, the common grading systems for, in, for infants, um, there's two, Corleos and the Kotlo system. And then the Kotlo system was um, recently revised, so they're basically the same thing. So you have a class one to a class four, Class one being attached to the um, tip of the tongue, um, as in this picture. Okay, uh, class two is right behind the tip of the tongue. And then your class three, middle of the tongue. So class three is when you start to see that Eiffel Tower type of appearance. Um, and that is considered posterior. Then class four is a posterior base of tongue or submucosal. Okay, the um, the lip. Uh, there's different um, system. There's different grading um, systems for the lip, but um, Kotlo has a one, two, three, and four. Four being wraps around the uh, incisive papilla or like the ridge. So four being like the worst, most attached. Typically, um, every baby is either a, I would say a two, three, or four. All right, um, for pediatrics and adults, so by pediatrics, I mean children that have, um, that are old enough to follow directions that you can have them do these um, specific movements. Um, that typically starts at, I would say, maybe three or so, and, and Lauren will go into that more. But um, I, I don't do this with the infants, and, um, and I don't do this with my youngest pediatric patients. So I typically see kids up to the age of um, usually like around two. Um, and then around three, we start with myofunctional therapy. We kind of go into a different um, avenue using Lauren's help as an OMT. Mm -hmm. But you can see, so this is, um, this system is called a TRMR. So tongue range of motion rate, um, ratio. Um, and this is an objective tool to assess tongue mobility. And um, so it takes into consideration um, the actual um, max, maximum opening of the mouth, and then um, the tongue and how it can actually touch the roof of the mouth and the compensations that go with that. And um, Dr. Robinson will be talking a little bit more about that, but that is a validated tool that is used. Um, and this really shows compensations. So compensations are basically when you're supposed to be using A, B, and C, now you're compensating, you're bringing all this extra stuff in that shouldn't be being used to make things work. And that's when you eventually have breakdown. Um, children, young adults are really good at compensating. 
the breakdown happens when you're older and that's what um, Dr. Robinson deals with on a daily basis is when the system just stops working um, because it's been overused and it's not meant to be used that way. All right, and this just kind of shows um, like the rulers that we use for that. All right, so the effect of the tongue on feeding growth and development. So um, this is a study, biomechanics of milk extraction. Um, so this study was uh, done in 2014, um, and it basically solved the controversy, controversy whether a baby sucks milk or uses a wave-like motion to extract milk um, using ultrasound, submental ultrasound, so basically from under the chin. <clears throat> and so what they found was that um, the posterior tongue, the back of the tongue, does work in a wave-like or peristaltic motion um, to generate suction and it contacts the hard soft palate junction <clears throat> to do so. The anterior front or front part of the tongue um, is basically um, rigid and it stays there and it follows what the posterior tongue does. Um, other interesting things that this study highlighted was that um, breastfed babies have higher oxygen saturation than bottle fed babies. Um, and that just goes to show that um, breastfeeding is, is a very complex, um, is very complex motions. I mean, you have, uh, it's very different than bottle feeding. So um, it really sets the tone for a lot of growth and development and, and a lot of um, oral facial muscle use. Okay. <clears throat> So this uh, shows how, this is actual ultrasound, shows like where the tongue position is, all that kind of stuff. Um, and this, this study concluded, like I said, the um, posterior tongue, really um, the motion of that tongue being able to lift up and go down, lift up and down, um, generates that um, pressure gradient and gets that um, suction going. Then we have uh, the baby should be nursing in a very relaxed fashion, shouldn't be using all the extra muscles, um, and it should look effortless. All right, the next study is an ultrasound study that was done by GEDS, um, and that was in uh, the Journal of Pediatrics in 2008, um, and that followed 24 mother baby dyads using ultrasound, and this study <clears throat> show that um, after a phrenectomy, there was less compression of the nipple by the tongue. Um, and that for all the infants, the milk, it, it, the milk intake, milk transfer rate, the latch score and maternal pain scores all improved significantly. Um, and so this shows, these are the pictures of the ultrasounds and you can see the before and after um, and the, uh, the compression. Basically you have a lot less um, nipple compression and the tongue is able to do what it needs to do. All right, so I have a video here. It's just, it's a minute long. So let's see if we can get that, that to play. Maybe not. Ami, can you help me out? Hey, Joanna. Yeah. <clears throat> so if, is that a link? It's a link. Okay. Um, and you're connected to the internet, of course? I sure am. All right. Um, so click, mm, hit, hit, next, hit next, see what happens. Oh, it just started working. Um, can you, all right, we can't see it. No. Okay, Riley. Hold on. We can hear it. Riley. Hold on. Um, wait, let me just see if I can. Yeah, if, I think if you can just do a overall screen share, we could probably see it. Ultrasound of a breastfeeding infant shows just how it works. There you go, that works. Okay. Although looking at an ultrasound video may be confusing, Let's take a closer look what is going on with the help of an animation. Note that the tongue moves not only back and forth, but also vertically. The 
without both these motions, which may be constricted by a tongue tie, that's the beginning of the difficulty and painful. Anterior tongue tie constricts the tongue motion shown in blue, which is the flexing part of the tongue. The area shown in red is constricted by a posterior tongue tie, which limits the tongue's vertical motion in the back. When the tongue is able to move freely, effective and painless breastfeeding occurs. All right. Let's see. I gotta find my PowerPoint. There you go. You're on. Can you see that okay? Okay. All right. So, are there changes in growth? So, this study um, was done in 2017 by Yoon et al., and this is a study out of Stanford. And it was published in the Journal of Orthodontics and Craniofacial Research, okay? So this study is a level three cross-sectional cohort study. Um, and it showed that restricted tongue mobility was associated with narrowing of the maxillary arch as well as elongation of the soft palate. All right. Um, so as the arch width increased uh, with mobility, so grade one and two, the soft palate length increases with decreased mobility. So the bottom line is that restricted tongue mobility was indeed associated with narrowing of the maxillary arch and elongation of the soft palate. And so the tongue and its consequences, uh, so this study kind of um, also talked about the, the following. So <clears throat> the tongue uh, balances the forces between the soft tissue and the skeleton. So when you don't have that mobility, you're gonna have developmental consequences. So the upward pressure of the tongue during swallow and then also during rest um, helps form the width and the shape of the hard palate. The hard palate is the roof of the mouth and it's also the floor of the nasal cavity. So when you have a maxillary constriction, when the upper jaw is becoming narrower, you're gonna have a narrower nasal cavity. Um, and when you have less space, you're gonna have mouth breathing, nasal obstruction, uh, and potentially sleep disordered breathing. Um, and this study showed that the high arch palate, so that's a palate that has a really um, big indentation in it, okay? that Gothic arch, um, is going to have a transverse um, deficiency as well. Um, and just a little bit more information about um, development and effects. Um, so uh, like I just discussed, there's another study um, by Guimano in 2013 about uh, nasal obstruction if the maxilla is underdeveloped. Um, we have uh, mouth breathing. <clears throat> the tongue's not resting where it should be resting. Uh, that's something that is Lauren's job to reteach children how to do, and adults as well. Um, and then eventually dealing with um, sleep apnea or sleep disordered breathing. And these are things that Ryan deals with. So the resting tongue posture. Um, on the left, this is what you should have if you have good mobility, if you have good behavior. So um, I'll often tell parents, um, you can have a, a a functional restriction, an actual restriction, um, a physical restriction of the tongue, okay, that, um, that prohibits the tongue from going where we want it to go. Or you can have a learned behavior um, because some people without tongue ties, they um, will have low resting tongue posture because they are um, mouth breathers, they have chronic allergies. There's a lot of different um, reasons why um, prolonged um, pacifier use, um, thumb sucking habits. So it's basically can be a physical restriction or a learned behavior. 
and ultimately it does the same thing at the end of the day it, it messes with the development of the upper jaw and that messes with a lot of other things <clears throat> so we're talking about the the arch shape so we have the um the v-shaped arch so this is what you're seeing on the bottom right so you can you can literally see this is your v-shaped arch you can see how the teeth are crowded um and this um this slide thank you um dr Raphael. um he is the owner of the Raphael Center for Integrative Orthodontics, and he lectures extensively um, on this subject. But I mean, he really, um, he, this, this presents, perf this is a perfect analogy um, on the arches. So you have that Gothic arch, and you can see how everything um, in that one picture uh, doesn't have a good substructure. And so then you have this crowding that happens. So if you have ideal, form typically um, most of the time you're going to have teeth that come in relatively straight um, because they have space to come in straight um, and you can see that that happens with a u-shaped arch so that's that roman arch it's well supported you can see that the tongue actually will fit in there because where the heck is the tongue going to fit in that v-shaped arch and the tongue doesn't fit in there um, and you're going to have the consequences of that all right, so Dr. Guimineau, um, he is um, known as the father um, of the study of sleep apnea. And this is a study out of Stanford University in 2015. He has since passed away, but he is really um, a founder in the field. And um, so this study um, basically examined whether a short lingual frenum um, would predispose children to sleep apnea. And what he found was that, yes, a short lingual frenum left untreated at birth is associated with obstructive sleep apnea at a later age. So normally at birth, the tongue is placed high in the palate and it basically, what it does is it stimulates the growth um, in that intermaxillary suture there. So um, the tongue rests up there, sucking, swallowing, uh, masticating, so chewing, all those things stimulate growth. That growth plate, it's, it's active till about um, three to 15 years of age. And that's when you're gonna have a lot of, you're gonna have a majority of development up to about age um, six, seven or so, um, but it's still um, viable. That suture is still growing until 13 to 15 years. Um, and then you have a uh, normal nasal breathing that's also associated with good tongue position. And um, like I said, that's something that Lauren will um, talk a little bit more about. But you need that stimulation of that tongue up on the roof of the mouth for proper growth. <clears throat> so more from this study, um, short lingual frenum leads to mouth breathing. Uh, you can have anterior, posterior crossbite. Um, and then inadequate growth of the mandible um, and abnormal growth of the maxilla. So things just aren't growing the, the proper way. And ultimately, all of these things can impact the size of the upper airway. And when you have a smaller airway, then you're going to have an increased risk of collapse during sleep. So that's when we talk about the sleep disordered breathing, um, sleep apnea. <clears throat> all right. So uh, one of my favorite people, Dr. Karen Wirtz, um, she coined this term, the oral restric restrictive complex, so ORC. It's all connected. Um, it is a fabulous way of describing like what goes on because you have kids with chronic ear infections, nasal problems. Um, they have uh, sleep apnea, sleep disordered breathing, a lot of different things going on. Um, and you can see here in this chart that I made, um, you have pain, um, difficulty concentrating. These are the kids with the ADD, ADHD. Um, grinding. So the development of the mouth and the craniofacial complex really sets the tone for so much. Um, it's not just a tongue tie. And so the oral restrictive complex um, is, is really a great way to emphasize how everything is really tied together. Um, and one thing affects another and it can truly be a domino effect. <clears throat> So Dr. Zaghi, 
Um, he is out of the Breathe Institute in California. Um, phenomenal ENT uh, researcher. Um, he likes to say, you gotta put out the smoke um, before the fire. And so that's what we talk about, identification, functional assessment. Um, and then with that, if you do a, a release on a child doing proper post-op, well, really pre-op and post-op care, and care of the, the dyad, okay, so the mom and the baby together. And then getting the baby back to habilitation. So um, if people think about rehabilitation, well, habilitation, um, you can think of it as the baby never had normal function because they never didn't have normal anatomy. Um, and so you're just kind of reteaching. And it can be a long process. <clears throat> So like I promised in the beginning, I was going to tell the story of my son, Dalton, and um, my uh, experience as being a mother that has to do a surgery on a baby at two and a half weeks old with all the hormones and everything. Not the, not the highlight of my week for sure, but I, it had to be done. Um, and that's just a great quote. Um, so the phrenectomy procedure um, on the left just kind of goes through a lot of the things that um, I do during a normal assessment with a with a um, a baby and a mom that comes in. Uh, these pictures are of me doing a procedure, um, and then this is me and Dalton. Um, I think it's right uh, right after the procedure. So, <clears throat> what do you see here? So on the left. Um, so these are all pictures of Dalton here. Um, on the left, you can see his lip. So what I'm trying to show here is how his lip was really restricted. It doesn't look quite that bad in this picture in the middle. You have that flaring of the lip, um, but his lip would lift up adequately, but it wouldn't actually flare out. And so um, the picture on the left shows this crease that would happen every single time that I would nurse him. Um, his lip literally just would not, um, flare and wouldn't um, extend to what it what it should have been. Um, bottom middle picture is his frenum and then the, the far right is him crying. So you can see how his tongue is low, um, it's tough, and it was just kind of no matter how hard he cried, it would just stay pretty much low to the bottom of his mouth. And then uh, but when you look at his at his actual frenum, I mean that doesn't look doesn't look that bad. Um, but then when you take in a lot of different things into account, you put the signs and the symptoms that the mom's going through, um, you put all these uh, puzzle pieces together, you get a whole different story. Um, so <clears throat> you have to understand normal anatomy um, to be able to know what you're doing. Um, and that, that just, that was something that I kind of um, discussed earlier that every baby has we all have frenums, it's, they're normal, it's when they become um, pathologic, okay, and they, they're causing issues, and then you have a tongue tie. So on the left, this is your um, Hazel Baker assessment, so this is the hat lift, um, and this is a validated tool that we use to um, assess function, and so my uh, assistant actually sent this to me, and she's like, um, fill this out for your, for your chart, and so I, that's why it's all scribbled on, on there. So I was um, emailing it back to her or texting it back to her. But um, for every baby that doesn't come in with one, like most of them do because they're coming from IBCLCs or SLPs that are doing this assessment in their office, then I will do one. Um, and so I did one on my own baby. And it's a grading scale. Um, and basically you look at appearance and function um, and you give them a, a score, so objective score. Uh, and that is a validated tool to use. Um, so some other things that we take into account are maternal symptoms, pain, infection, supply, the baby's symptoms. So is the baby gassy, refluxy, not gaining weight? Um, that's like the failure to thrive um, when it gets extreme. Short feeds, long feeds, frequent feedings. Um, and then you look at appearance. So is it a class one tongue tie uh, to the tip of the tongue? Is it a posterior tongue tie? Posterior tongue ties, they're typically never caught unless there is an issue um, because it is, it is uh, the classification that really relies heavily on symptoms. Um, and that's why it's so important to work with lactation consultants because 
their job is to sit down and they're specialists at this. And they look at um, not just the baby, but the mom, the fit of the baby and the mom, the anatomy. And so when I see, um, when I see the patients, I'll typically tell them that their job is to weed out the background noise to make sure supply is good, um, that, um, so supply, that fit is good, um, all these different things, positioning that can um, cause pain and cause uh, dysfunction, but maybe it's not necessarily a tongue tie that's causing it. So they look, that's the first step is making sure all these other things are um, being properly handled, that positioning is, is good. Um, and then we start looking at function um, to make sure that we have all everything lined up properly. So they're kind of getting rid of the background noise um, by assessing all those other things. <clears throat> so this is Dalton. Um, the picture on the far left is him before the procedure. Um, and then the one right next to it is him 24 hours after. And you can see his tongue mobility is is really good. It's, it's a lot different. Um, and I had a whole series of pictures and they're all very similar to this. So get a lot more mobility and, and elevation from his, um, of his tongue. And in, um, as the studies I presented earlier showed, really important to have um, posterior elevation for proper breastfeeding, proper tongue positioning later on, um, proper growth and development. So the back of the tongue is just, in, just as important, if not more important than the anterior tongue. So when people just see, they look at the front of the tongue, like everything looks good. It's just, that's just such a small portion of it. So, um, and then the picture on the far right is him um, about two weeks post-op. So I think it was actually day 12 or 13. And you can see his tongue is, um, you can see the little um, white, um, that's what I call the soggy scab that's um, still healing there. Um, great mobility, symptoms greatly improved. Um, you know, when you have babies that are um, chompers, gaggers, this, that, I mean, you name it, I've heard it all from the moms, but um, he truly um, changed a lot after the procedure. I'm not just saying that because it's my baby, but it, it really did um, work really well for him. So. Um, and then this is a picture of um, the lingual palatal suction. So babies are programmed, they should be able to do this from day one. And so if your baby has their mouth closed, which they should um, all the time because they're obligate nasal breathers, they should have their mouth closed. If they don't, you wanna be closing your baby's mouth as long as they don't have something going on with their nasal complex um, to train them to keep their mouth closed. Um, and the tongue, if you pull down on their bottom lip, gently on their chin, it will show that their tongue is, um, their tongue should be suctioned to the roof of their mouth. And there he is, this is post Um, I don't know, he's wearing the same outfit, so it could be a, the same day, I don't even know anymore. But, um, so this is a picture of him, and then these are my daughters, and um, that's a Disney cruise we went on in 2020 but before all this happened. Um, but uh, usually at this point in the PowerPoint, you know, people might say no babies were harmed in the making of this PowerPoint. Um, this was not for the PowerPoint. It was just a, um, you know, it just, just so happened to be uh, at the same time. And I was able to use material because I documented every day and the healing and everything. And I lived through it again, but from a different perspective. My second baby, Fiona, I had no idea. It was um, a disaster of everything, and it was really stressful. This time, I was like, I'm, this is what I do, and, um, and it was still stressful. The procedure itself, I was able to um, tune out the fact that it was my baby, and after, like, the, I was able to calm down and, and do it, and, and then uh, have a big sigh of relief when he barely even cried afterwards, um, and so he was a champ, and uh, you know, uh, I'm glad that it was over with and everything is healed nicely. So, um, you know, don't take it from me. Um, I have a little testimonial here. Um, one of our patients about the, um, 
pain and sleep center. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but just saying that, uh, you know, it's, it's nice when you, when you offer a certain caliber of care, patients know it, they recognize it and they will refer other patients to you. So um, my biggest recommendation to um, providers that are interested in this, just know, know the ramifications of not doing anything at an early age. It is so much easier to treat a baby at two weeks old, um, whether it's two weeks, two months, three months, eight months, is a whole heck of a lot easier than at age three or two, two, three, four, um, up until they're old enough to be coming to you with a problem um, or with a speech problem or a feeding issue. Um, you got to get it when they're babies because all those, when a mom says that they're having issues or having pain, something isn't right, you listen to them and you get them to the right provider. Um, someone that's a specialist that can listen to them um, and do a proper identification um, of, their, of their tongue, a proper functional assessment because that can really change, um, can change so much for, for someone's life, um, not only for the baby, but for the mom's happiness. Uh, so important to do. So if, if you take nothing else away from this, just get a team. Your team will make or break you. Um, it, it's all about the team um, and making sure that you have proper systems in place, um, proper referral network, um, and you have well-trained staff and that you're all working together and you're on the same page because it's, it's a lot more complex than just doing um, a laser surgery on the baby. You want to have, um, you want to have great outcomes. You want to change lives and you want to make uh, parents feel empowered that they're making the right decision. You're not forcing them to do anything. You're educating them. You're letting them take, have power over their decision-making process and feeling good about it at the end of the day. And that really is the game changer in all of this. Um, so if you have any um, specific questions for me, there's my email address. More than happy to answer questions. Um, follow me on um, Instagram, um, Facebook. Um, we have a great website, painandsleepcenter.com. Um, I try to post content on my Instagram page. Um, so check me out there. Um, and hopefully uh, you know, I can answer any other questions for you guys. We're gonna keep the questions, uh, we're gonna hold off on them until the end of the whole lecture, uh, just because um, um, some of your questions might be answered by Leah or Lauren or Dr. Robinson, um, or you can just email me and I'll be up happy to get back to you as well. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Green. Hey, uh, Joanna, can you do me a favor? Can you uh, just scroll over Leah's um, box and make her host? All right, Leah, you are the host and you should be able to share your screen. Okay. So I'll just, while Leah's doing that, I'll give a little bit of uh, background about my relationship. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So I've been working with Leah for literally probably three years since I started treating babies. And um, Leah was at the hospital, Christiana Care. And um, anytime I have a complex um, bottle fed baby, an older child, Leah is my go to person. She does a phenomenal job. Um, and she works with the NICU babies. So truly uh, inspirational what she does. And it's like I said, it's all about the team. When you, can, when you can call up your, um, your, uh, your team and chat about patients and kind of figure out the best course for them, that's what it's all about. And that, that's what breeds success um, and helps the parents and um, everyone kind of uh, feel the best about what's going on. And it's a stressful time for everyone. So you gotta be on the same page. And uh, Leah is definitely, she's been a great um, asset to our team. So thank you. Sure. You know, on that note, I know that everyone's already seen this slide, but um, I just wanted to say both of my kids had um, lip and tongue uh, releases. Uh, my son, Jack, his was done uh, like a little over three years ago, and we had a really good experience. Um, you know, it got the job done. Um, but the, that his experience compared to my daughter's 
uh, release, which was done about a year ago. Um, Dr. Green actually did the release. Um, you know, Jax was good, but the experience that we had with Dr. Green and her team, um, you just, you can't put words into that. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the evaluation process, um, everything from getting a referral, the evaluation, uh, recommendations, and then post-procedure and follow-up. So first I'm going to talk about uh, referral. We usually get referrals from pediatric dentists. Um, we have a lot of families that are, are coming in themselves. They've, they've done some research online and, and they want um, to get some answers. Um, we have a lot of referrals that come in from IBCLCs um, or people that I may have seen um, in the hospital. They may, um, I may have planted the seed that, you know, something, something to watch out for and they, they come back and see us. And then also from pediatricians and ENTs. Um, and then when they come in, um, I usually uh, spend about an hour and a half with the families. It's a really... Um, I like to, to give them time to kind of unpack their bags and their feelings. Um, but also, infants are unpredictable and uh, you can't really make a baby eat. Um, so uh, the evaluation, either we do case history first and then the baby eats, or we flip it up, baby eats, and then we do case history. Um, so for the case history, I wanna know everything I can. I wanna know about their pregnancy and birth history, um, any pertinent medical and family history, developmental milestones, um, depending on, on the baby's age, um, any concerns that they may have and any red flags, things like, is the baby gassy, fussy, either they never sleep, um, how, how's weight, um, has it been going down or up, too fast, too slow, um, are, are they colicky? Do they have reflux? Are they throwing up all the time? These are all red flags that potentially there may be some um, lip or tongue ties going on. Um, we also like to set goals um, for, for the um, evaluation. And then um, I ask about how they're fed. How are they feeding? Are they breastfeeding? Are they bottle feeding? Are they doing both? Um, and then as best they can, what kind of schedule the baby's on. The next thing I do is uh, the assessment. I know that Dr. Green had shared the hat lift, uh, the slide of the hat lift, but this is an objective measure that I use um, and it assesses appearance and function. The other thing I do is I look at structure. Um, so, you know, looking inside the mouth, what, what things am I seeing? Um, do they have low tone? Do they have high tone? Um, when I'm sitting there looking at the baby, are they bring, breathing through their nose? Are they breathing through their mouth? Um, how are they sucking on the pacifier? Um, what does their palate look like? Um, and then how are their reflexes? Um, are they diminished? Um, are they hyperactive? any lip callusing going on. And then the next thing I look at is actual feeding. So during feeding, um, these are kind of a list of things that I look at. Um, their seal, any leaking or loss of milk, um, the time of the swallow, and then their overall suck swallow breathe pattern. And then I also wanna make sure that, that babies are, are feeding safely. So any indications of possible aspiration. Um, and then if they're breastfeeding, we definitely want to um, think about the mom too, any uh, pain or trauma. And then just in general, as the baby's feeding, um, during the feeding, after the feeding, are they comfortable? Are they uncomfortable? Is this a positive or negative experience for them? And then on the bottom right of this slide, I wanted to share a research article about the mechanics of, of sucking that I thought was really interesting. Um, they found that exclusively breastfed babies, um, their sucking pattern, they have more sucks per burst and the same number of pauses, but the pauses are of shorter duration. So then you look at uh, 
babies that are bottle fed, they have fewer steps per burst and the same number of pauses as the breastfed infants, but the pauses were longer. And then the mixed feeding group, uh, their sucks were based on how they were currently being fed, so breastfeeding or bottle feeding. And the infants eventually adopted their own individual sucking pattern. And I thought that there was, this was really interesting because it really is all about individuality. Every single baby and mom is going to feed differently, and we really need to look at each of the mom baby dyads as an individual, as, as their own feeding team. So um, while, the, um, while the parents are feeding the babies, I like to look at any, um, any things that we might be able to change to make the feeding better, either for the infant or the parent. Um, so I look at the position of the baby. You know, if you think about when a baby's breastfeeding, they're not cradled in arms necessarily. They're laying on their side. So their ear, their shoulder, and their hip, they're all pointing towards the floor. So we call that the sideline position. So sometimes um, bottle fed babies that are, are really um, having uh, a difficult time digesting, sometimes if we just flip them in that sideline position, it can be helpful. Um, I also look at um, what bottle are they using? Um, what nipple type are they using? Is it a narrow base nipple? Is it a wide base nipple? Um, and then also the flow rate. Sometimes just changing, making those minor changes can be helpful. Um, and then I look at how um, their lips are able to flange around uh, the bottle. And sometimes that is a great indicator that, you know, potentially we need to to go and see about getting a revision. Um, and then another compensation that um, parents can provide is chin and cheek support um, to kind of help with that, the labial seal and latch. Um, and then pacing is another uh, suggestion um, that, that we make for some of the bottle fed infants. Um, the next thing we do um, towards the end of the evaluation is develop a plan of care. So we, we talk about goals. You know, what are, what are your goals going to be um, for, for feeding? How do, how do you want um, you know, feeding to go? Um, and then we also discuss um, as appropriate whether or not a labial and or lingual release um, is recommended. Uh, the other thing I also have them do is to demonstrate uh, the exercises. Um, so sometimes, you know, it, it's as simple as, you know, let's, let's work on latch a little bit. Maybe we can go ahead and start with some of these exercises, um, you know, so to maybe, you know, avoid a, um, a release if it's, you know, if I'm not seeing any other indicators. And then, um, these are some uh, referrals that I make. Um, so I flip them back to, to a pediatric dentist um, for the labial and or lingual release. Um, I put them in contact with an IBCLC, um, an ENT potentially if there's some threat of obstruction, uh, a pediatrician, um, an OTPT uh, for potential torticollis or other um, muscle um, difficulties, um, sometimes neurology, and then uh, we're also able to do uh, video swallow studies um, if I think that there could potentially be a, a baby who's at risk for aspiration. Um, and then follow up after the procedure. Um, I always check the uh, labial and lingual sites to make sure they're healing okay, if there are any adhesions. Um, the parent and caregivers, again, they always demonstrate the exercises. I know that Dr. Green and her team do a great job with teaching um, the family to do that. I, a lot of times, will repeat the hat lift to see if there is a difference uh, pre and post uh, phrenectomy. Um, I, again, I'm looking at the at feeding, um, I'm assessing the mom and baby, and then we're looking at any compensations that may be needed. And then we update the plan of care. Um, and then I typically follow the mom and baby until, um, 
everything is smooth sailing. I think that that's really important. So sometimes it's every week, sometimes it's once a month, and sometimes it's come back and see me in three months or come back and see me when you guys are starting uh, First Foods. And I think that is the quick and dirty of the evaluation. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Leah. So can you make me host? I did. Yep. Yeah. You yeah. should be good to go. Sweet. All right. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Awesome. All right, guys. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, um, kind of a quick rundown of, uh, the infant pr program that we have in our office. Um, again, like I said in the beginning, it's quite amazing what they've built, um, over the years. It's quite amazing. The team that they've assembled, um, it truly is a multidisciplinary, um, uh, process for mom and baby. And so now jumping into the kind of older kids and uh, the adults, we're going to talk about um, tongue ties, uh, lip ties, and any sort of oral restrictions that require assessment um, at an older age. So we um, like to call this the functional approach to um, tethered oral tissues. And so as Dr. Green mentioned, um, thanks, Dr. Green. Uh, as Dr. Green mentioned, um, Dr. Zaghi has been quite an influence on me uh, professionally. I started training with him uh, a number of years back, um, and I've truly just absorbed as much as I possibly can for him. So for me, um, getting into these restrictions inside the mouth, being that I treat a lot of uh, TMD and airway dysfunction, uh, sleep breathing disorders like sleep apnea, um, this was just, uh, it just was, was next for me. So, um, being able to train with him who I consider the expert in this field, um, and has been a personal mentor of, my, of mine has just been uh, fantastic. So this is a multidisciplinary evaluation and management of adult and pediatric oral tethered tissues through myofunctional therapy combined with a functional frenuloplasty procedure. So there's a lot of names being um, given to a, the actual procedure to release um, a restriction frenuloplasty, a functional frenuloplasty is what I do. Um, that is not what Dr. Green does. She uses the laser. So we're going to talk about some um, kind of the differences between treating adults versus treating babies. Um, but I really do hope that all of you get out of this um, when we are done that the reason we do this is for myofunctional therapy purposes, and it's not necessarily just to release a restriction. It's got to be in conjunction with proper therapy. So I'm fortunate enough, like I said, to have Lauren in my office, who's a myofunctional therapist. So we're going to talk about how we treat our patients together. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of brief little, thing, um, brief little things just as an introduction to this. And then Lauren's going to talk about myofunctional therapy, and then we're going to go into a case study as well. So the, as um, Dr. Green mentioned, the tongue range of motion ratio is what we use in older kids and adults. Um, I'm not going to go through that uh, quite um, extensively, as you guys can see the pictures, but as you guys can probably see, you know, we have grade one, we have grade two, we have grade three, and we have grade four. Grade three and grade four being kind of the obvious ones that probably need a procedure in order to help them out. Um, so there's a lot of compensations for tongue ties, and we see this every single day in our clinic. So it's very hard to evaluate these. So Dr. Zaghi and his team have made it very um, a lot easier for us to kind of get a, um, a classification of these uh, restrictions. Um, however, we see a lot of patients with a lot of compensations going on. So as you notice, here and here, like this patient, this patient might trick you. This patient might look like they have possibly a grade two tongue tie, right? But can you see all this neck strain? So over here, this is kind of the real assessment where the patient is open as wide as they can and the, and the tip of their tongue is trying to reach the little bump called the incisive papilla behind their front teeth. So this is really a grade three compensation, but for the untrained eye, this might look like a grade two and grade twos can, some, some can sometimes kind of slip through the cracks and not be treated. So we have to look for these compensations. We, we have to be kind of educated and aware of if these are going on. Like Dr. Green said, if these um, compensations are not 
kind of addressed early in life, patients just kind of learn to live with them. They just kind of learn to get by. And so our goal at our center is never to let a patient get by. It's to optimally improve their health. It's to optimally improve the issues that they, they come in for. So it's, we have to be kind of detective sometime and be able to um, figure out if these compensations are going on. Uh, one of my favorite analogies with this is um, having a tongue tie as an adult is like walking around on your tippy toes all day long. And so could we do it? Maybe, maybe if we, if we strengthen up some of our other muscles um, and strengthen up different muscles within our legs, uh, maybe we could do it. But is there eventually going to be problems that result from that? Y yeah, uh, probably. So we don't want our patients to walk around on their tippy toes. We want our patients to have that range of motion um, that is most beneficial for them for whatever reason they're coming in for, for, for the variety of reasons why we treat this, which I'm about to go into. So a little bit more of a simplistic definition for this is the functional definition. Can the tip of the tongue reach the upper front teeth when the mouth is wide open? And that's basically what it comes down to. If the tongue can't reach the upper front teeth when the mouth is wide open, then more than likely we're suffering from some sort of restriction in there. Okay, so the functional frenuloplasty, that procedure that we do is a surgical procedure to release the genial glossal myofascial restrictions or the tethered oral tissues, whether that be the tongue, the lip, the buccal ties, um, which may contribute to problems with sleep, breathing, pain, swallowing, speech, or posture. We do, we do use a multidisciplinary protocol that integrates myofunctional therapy, sometimes physical therapy, and it's really key to understand this. We do myofunctional therapy before, during, and after surgery. If there's no myofunctional therapy, there is no tongue release. I refuse to release a tongue for a, or a lip for a patient who refuses to go through therapy before, during, and after, because we now know what the literature tells us. So I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of misperceptions out there about tongue ties. Um, I'm just gonna brief, I'm just gonna run through these really quickly. So uh, tongue ties don't exist or they're a fad. Um, if you can stick your tongue past your lips, there's no tie. Tongue ties will go away on their own. Tongue releases are done by dentists so they can pay for their fancy lasers. Tongue ties should only be completed with a laser. Tongue ties have no literature to support them. I'm too old to have my tongue tie release. We hear that um, on a daily basis. Um, all ties should be treated. No, I hopefully you just saw that from Dr. Green and um, Leah that no, not all tongue ties need to be treated. Um, a tongue tie will make all of my problems go away. It is the magic pill. And unfortunately, um, we've learned over many, many years of experience that uh, there is no magic pill out there. So it really does require a multidisciplinary um, effort here. And um, there are no tongue tie experts out there, which I will defend myself and Dr. Green and all these people that have taken all these advanced courses um, that there is. So what is the purpose of a release in an adult or a, um, or a child? And it really just comes down to um, to improve the efficacy or the compliance of myofunctional, speech, swallowing, and or physical therapy. And really, there's nothing more. When you, be, when you, when you are no longer a baby and um, you become three, we then look at a tongue release as sort of a tool, as sort of a, a piece of the puzzle in order to aid in um, the therapy that that particular child or adult is going through, whether it be my functional therapy, speech, swallowing, physical therapy, whatever it is. There is a great amount of literature out there. Dr. Green showed you a ton of literature out there to support this. That is in order to um, support the therapy with, with the tongue tie release. There is very little or no literature that supports tongue tie surgery alone without therapy. So we are very careful about what we say to our patients. We never say releasing your tongue or doing a tongue tie release will fix your issues, your sleep issues, your pain issues, your breathing issues, your speech and swallowing issues. We always say releasing the tongue will help the ability to make progress with therapy. Again, it is to aid in the success of myofunctional therapy. And that's what Lauren's about to talk about. So uh, one study, um, Dr. Green did a great job bringing up a lot of other studies. One study that I wanted to go over real quick um, is another study by Dr. Zaghi out of Stanford. And this just uh, was released in 2019. This 
this past year. And basically what they looked at was they looked at a big um, kind of grouping and a big, um, a, a lot of different uh, uh, case studies, 348 to be exact, of the procedure of doing a lingual frenuloplasty, so uh, releasing a tongue with myofunctional therapy. And basically what they found was there is very, very, very high rates of patient satisfaction and treatment overall success. And there's very, very low risk of minor complications. I think um, Dr. Green said it best to me. She had a, she had a, a baby boy this time. And she said, you know, it's, it's crazy to me. Sometimes mothers come in and um, they talk about, oh my gosh, I'm so scared about this tongue tie surgery. It's so serious. And, uh, you know, it, just to have, um, just to have the, um, uh, the circumcision done um, in the hospital is a way, way more traumatic experience than to have a tongue release. Um, and so we don't, we look at circumcision as kind of a necessary um, surgery that takes place for, for, for boys. Um, but we don't look at it at a tongue release as a necessary um, sort of surgical um, uh, treatment option, um, which is just crazy. Which is just crazy. So this study really uh, did a good job of putting myofunctional therapy with lingual frenuloplasty kind of on the map and kind of um, you know giving me even more reason and conviction to keep doing you know what I'm doing. And with the results that I'm getting to my clinic, um, I helped Dr. Zaghi out with uh, this by sending in some of my cases. And so I'm going to have Lauren go over myofunctional therapy in just a second, but. Um, just as a quick little introduction, myofunctional therapy is basically the treatment of facial muscles to improve muscle tone, establish correct functions and control of the tongue, lips, and lower jaw. These muscles of our mouth and our face help establish the development of our jaws, our teeth, and most importantly in our clinic, we use it for airway purposes. So we teach people to breathe through their noses and not through their mouths. So the, the typical goals of myofunctional therapy are get the lips together, get the tongue up on the palate, which is what the um, the tongue release addresses, and then breathe through the nose. So that is basically the goals of myofunctional therapy. That is the goal of a tongue release therapy. The goal of a tongue release therapy is to help aid in getting that tongue up to the roof of the mouth. And again, it's just one piece of the puzzle. So with that, I am going to um, basically turn it over to Lauren. Well, uh, Lauren, actually, let me go through these slides and then I'll turn it over to you. So let me uh, address what are some of the indications that I um, see in my clinic that I do for surgery. So um, as Dr. Green and Leah said, you know, nursing and feeding issues are kind of the ones that we see um, uh, earliest in life. Um, Leah does a lot with the speech and swallowing issues. Um, and then after that, we see, uh, we start to see a lot more of the symptoms that Dr. Green talked about. Sleep and breathing issues, clenching of the teeth, grinding of the teeth, grinding when you're asleep in order to compensate um, for a bad airway, in order to compensate for a low resting tongue position. So TMJ, headaches, neck pain, back pain, reflux, heartburn, digestive issues. Lauren talks to her patients all the time about how the GI tract is related to tongue position and, and breathing. Tightness around the upper neck, shoulders are high open. I have a ton of patients that come to me for a tongue release just because they have, they're, they're so balled up, they're so tight, they have so much tension in the, in the fascia that um, Dr. Green alluded to earlier. We treat a lot of patients with, with fascial restrictions, with restrictions that radiate all the way down their body. And if we look at the very superior part of that um, fascial restriction, a lot of times it comes down to the tongue and how tied that is. So some of the contraindications for surgery, when will we not do surgery? Well, like I said, if someone's not going to commit to doing myofunctional therapy, forget about it. Go find somebody else with a fancy laser. Go find somebody else with a pair of scissors. Anybody can learn how to snip a tongue or to, or to, or to laser it. But in our program, we make sure that it's successful. Without myofunctional therapy, there is no literature to support the, the release of a tongue. So if you're not going to commit to me for with myofunctional therapy, forget about me ever, ever releasing your tongue. So this comes down, this also ties into the unrealistic expectations of the benefits. I have a patient that I just was, spoke on the phone with, um, he, Lauren, you were, I think you were there a couple of days ago. Hey, I want my tongue release. Um, I know it's going to fix my sleep apnea. False. That is not going to fix your sleep apnea. You have to do therapy with that. We have to do a full functional assessment. We have to be able to do a full workup in order to figure out all the pieces of the puzzle in order to optimize your outcome. So some of the other uh, contraindications is extremely narrow palate. So when you have a really narrow palate, 
one thing you really need to be cautious of is what happens when you actually do release that tongue. Like Dr. Green showed, the arches, especially the maxillary arch, um, the upper arch is developed with, top, with proper tongue position. So say a 40 year old comes into my office with this high arch narrow palate. They've had a tongue tie their whole entire life because I'm here to tell you guys, tongue ties don't happen later in life. These are, these are tongue ties that were missed earlier in life. So a tongue tie was missed for whatever reason, the, the patient for, had, uh, develops and has this narrow palate. The last thing I want to do is release somebody's tongue. Then what the heck is going to happen with that tongue? Where is it going to go? The tongue is supposed to sit in the roof of the mouth. So if we don't have enough tongue space, if we have an extremely narrow palate, I'm very, very, very cautious of whether or not I'll actually do a release for that, for that patient. Again, another thing about spatial recognition, that's why we do a full exam, that's why we use CBCT. I will not do a tongue release on someone who has a limited posterior airway space. And I'm talking anybody under one centimeter. If I pull up CBCT and I can only see um, what, less than one centimeter from basically the, the, the very posterior part of the base of the tongue to the, to the posterior pharynx, no way in hell am I going to release that tongue and let that tongue fall back even more and, call, and cause an even bigger problem. One thing we've learned over the years through trial and error is that if we release a tongue improperly because of, and there's insufficient posterior airway space, not only are we not helping that patient, but we can actually give that patient um, a bigger problem. We can cause more sleep issues. We can cause more grinding of the jaws. And so we really want to make sure that we're doing a full evaluation in order to figure out whether or not this patient is a candidate for surgery. Okay. There's a lot of other factors that are at, 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 um, at play here, but you guys just needed to know that uh, unless a comprehensive evaluation is done, we do not release the tongue. So with that, Lauren, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of go over the myofunctional therapy part of that. And then I'm going to get back into our case study and we're going to wrap up with some questions tonight. All right, Lauren, you're on. Okay. So the success of a functional frenial plasty is based on a complete and effective release of tethered oral tissues with the incorporation of myofunctional therapy before, during, and after surgery. It is crucial to do exercises prior to surgery for a successful outcome. There will be easier surgical dissection with minimal bleeding and trauma when tissues have been well prepared. Then, of course, after the frenum is released, the tongue and oral muscles will need to be retrained and strengthen. So just remember the muscles in the tongue have been tied down so they never learn to move or rest properly. What are the benefits of doing pre and post procedure myofunctional therapy? So of course we want to improve a muscle tone prior to surgery. Even some muscle tone makes it easier to complete a good procedure. And then we want to begin to teach awareness even prior to surgery. So having the lips closed, breathing through the nose, and then of course establishing that proper tongue posture, the tip to tail to the roof of the mouth because it stabilizes the jaw. And then we want to eliminate the compensation in the jaw, the cheek, the lip, the neck, and the floor of the mouth, and then reestablish and recorrect the breathing, speaking, chewing, and swallowing patterns acquired as a result of the tongue tie. And then of course, we want to prevent the relapse of oral facial myofunctional disorders. So myofun myofunctional therapy guidelines. So therapy is truly tailored to each patient and what the patient needs. It consists of five therapy sessions pre-surgery and five therapy sessions post-surgery. And really the number of sessions is truly dependent on patient development we really are addressing the soft tissue dysfunctions and the habituation phase is um, therapy is followed with that and it can be up to a year of checkups. So how can we prepare the patient for surgery success? So the patient has to be able to do a section and hold getting that full tongue to the roof of the mouth to the palate for at least one to two minutes. This exercise is so important for patients to establish I even encourage patients to not only practice the sitting up, but also doing it lying back because on the day of the procedure, they will be lying back as we're 
doing the procedure. So really getting that good suction and hold to the roof of the mouth. And then of course, we wanna make sure they can perform a lateral tongue movement. So really getting that tongue touching one corner to the other, kind of as if the tongue were pivoting it to one side to the other. And then can they do the perform the vertical tongue movement? So taking the tongue up, reaching the upper lip, and then going down to the chin, so kind of up and down vertically. And of course, trying to do these with minimal compensation to the best of their ability with lip control, cheek control, and jaw control. So post-operative frenuloplasty care. So the healing period is typically one to three days, and it's recommended to take it easy the first few days. So some bleeding is to be expected in the first few days. Patients can expect some mild um, swelling, pain, or discomfort as a normal process of wound healing. Generally, it is mild and can be controlled with over-the-counter pain meds such as Tylenol or ibuprofen. And then of course, once that pain is controlled, light movements with the tongue are recommended. And once cleared by the myofunctional therapist, more advanced exercises will be performed to improve muscle retraining and strengthening. So I guess I will pass that on to you now to do the case. So just make me host again? Yep. Oh, sorry. Do you remember how to do it? Yeah, it's in the corner. I have it. I had to exit out of everything first. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, guys, I'm going to jump back in with the case study. So um, I have a lot of these cases that I've done over the years, and um, I think this is one of the uh, one of my first ones. This was a, uh, a few years ago that I, I had the chance to treat um, Stephen. It was, you know, in a time where we were really screening. Um, a lot of people hard in our general uh, dental practice for sleep issues and airway issues and things like that. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these, um, a lot of these cases that, uh, that don't get caught by Leah and, um, and Dr. Green when they're kids, they end up, you know, unfortunately in my chair when they're um, 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. I mean, I just, uh, Lauren and I are preparing to release a 70 year old in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, there, it's, it's really never too late to, to identify a problem. Um, but here's a little case study on um, Stephen, who we got to know quite well. So uh, a few years back, Stephen was uh, 28 years old and his chief complaints were he had a hard time falling asleep. Um, he had a lot of sinus congestion going on. He knew that he was a teeth grinder um, his entire life. He had some daytime fatigue. Um, he had a very poor sleep with frequent awakenings, and uh, he was aware that he breathed through his mouth, which we all know is very dangerous. Um, he had been told that he sounded like Darth Vader with a deep grunt when he was sleeping. And so um, a victory for him, and this is what we do for all of our patients, why are you here? We basically take chief complaints of why the patient thinks that they want to come see us, and then what would be a victory for you? So a victory for Stephen would be he wants to achieve better sleep and wants to be able to breathe through his, his nose more often. And so... Um, when we do a review of his systems, uh, like a lot of people these days, Stephen was diagnosed with anxiety and depression and had difficulty concentrating. Um, and this wasn't just um, now, this was his whole entire childhood. He had some troubles in school um, and he's a smart kid and he, he, he worked really hard, but just, you know, had, had some troubles um, with learning. And so um, that kind of progressed and later on in life, he had uh, speech difficulties. Um, he got dizzy from time to time. Um, and then kind of later on in life when he was um, in his 20s, he, no he started noticing he was having uh, some stiff, painful joints. And so again, like a lot of patients we see, he was on a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. He, uh, inhibitor. he was on fluoxetine, 50 milligrams um, for his anxiety and depression. He was taking Benadryl in order to try and get to sleep. He was taking melatonin in order to try and get to sleep. And he was taking ibuprofen to try and control some of his pain. Um, and so Stephen was given a night guard from his, his dentist for his tooth grinding. Um, and uh, I'm here to tell you, that was me. I, 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 made, him a, I made him a night guard. And uh, I, really, I really regret it because I didn't know what I didn't know. As Dr. Green said, 
you know, when she was speaking, we don't, we, a lot of us just don't know what we don't know. And so I'm embarrassed to say, you know, here that I gave, I made him a night guard and I thought that that was going to solve his issues. I really didn't know what the source of his grinding was. I didn't know why he was grinding his teeth so much in order to, you know, keep his airway open and, and, you know, counteract the tongue tie that he had going on. So, um, I'm proud to have, you know, gotten back to this guy and helped fix him. Um, as far as the history goes, he doesn't have anybody else in his family he, who he knows who suffers from obstructive sleep apnea. He also was uh, diagnosed with torticollis. And so, you know, like we did a lot in our practice, we referred him out for a sleep study and here's his home sleep test. And Stephen at 28 years old was diagnosed with mild obstructive sleep apnea. So Stephen, Stephen stops breathing 11.3 times every single hour for more than 10 seconds. He desaturates, his oxygen drops in his body to 91%. And for all of us who know about oxygen, we never should be below 95. Um, and he has 222 snores. He's, and, and this, guys, is him on his stomach. So what if he slept on his back? This might be two times, three times, four times as worse. He's sleeping on his stomach and he still has choking spells at nighttime. He still can't breathe. So if you take a look at Steven, we, we have a much more refined process of the way we take photos um, nowadays in our office, but this was back, you know, within our general practice. And you can see Steven is posturally, he's a mess. Look at this left shoulder. Look at his, look at his can't, look at his head position. Look at his, um, look at his jaw position. Look at the can't he has with his teeth. Look at his forward head posture. Look at his wide stance. I mean, you name it, this guy, is the is 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 a book he is the textbook of compensations that he's made through his entire life so is there something that we were missing so as you can see we took some photos like we always do and then down here sorry down here in the lower right oh what's that thing right there well that ladies and gentlemen is called a tongue tie and so let's go figure out exactly what type of classification he had. So when Steven opens big, he can get up to about 41 millimeters total. When he does his tongue to his spot, which is what um, Lauren was describing and what Dr. Green was describing earlier, he can only go to 17. So if we've used Dr. Zaghi's tongue range of motion ratio, that is a grade three tongue tie. That is very bad. Anything under 50% really probably needs to be addressed and really needs to be treated. So this was a no brainer. We had missed this. I had missed this for all the years I had seen Steven. I did. I never looked under the hood. I never saw what was causing all these issues for Steven, the speech, the learning difficulties, all that stuff. I missed it. I missed all of it. So here's the CBCT of Steven's airway. And like I said, we take CBCT on all of our patients to learn more about them, learn more about their structures. We never want to release a structure and give a structure freedom and range of motion if we don't know what, what the effect is going to be on the, on the rest of the structures. And so as we can see here, Steven has a very, a very limited um, narrow posterior pharynx. And so no, he is above one centimeter. So he is still a candidate for... Um, for, for a tongue tie surgery, but he's severely underdeveloped. You can see the tipping of this teeth here. You can see the tipping of the, both the maxillary teeth and the mandibular teeth. So it's really important to take CBCT and understand everything that could potentially happen once you give this, this patient um, uh, a, a good, uh, good uh, release. Um, so we never treat without a diagnosis, of course. 95% uh, of uh, effective treatment comes down to uh, a diagnosis. Without a diagnosis, you don't know what the heck you're doing. So get a diagnosis before you, you jump into any sort of treatment. Um, so his diagnosis is he has obstructive sleep apnea. He has ankylosia, which is a tongue tie. He breathes through his mouth. He has a tongue thrust, which Lauren deals with on a daily basis. And he has a, and he has a malocclusion. His bite doesn't come together correctly. So what is our treatment plan? Well, we're going to start off by doing myofunctional therapy. We're going to then do a functional frenuloplasty, which is about what I'm about to show you. We are then going to go back to myofunctional therapy. Remember, guys, myofunctional therapy before, during, and after the procedure. No ifs, ands, or buts. Four to six weeks before, no ifs, ands, or buts. Myofunctional therapy the day of surgery. Myofunctional therapy four to six weeks after 
um, surgery, right? Then we're gonna reevaluate his sleep and see how much better he got. And then we're gonna determine if he needs a sleep appliance. Does he need, or, does he need orthopedic development of his jaws? Well, we're gonna find that out. So here is part of the release that I do. As you can see, it is a lot deeper. It is a lot more um, kind of, um, it's a lot more of a uh, precision type of uh, procedure than using a laser. So we literally dissect back the, the, the fascia. We literally we we literally just get him numb in the area that we're working on we want to see him stretching throughout the whole entire procedure we literally watch this guy's tongue get more range of motion as we are doing our procedure and so as you can see here in the upper left so that's the little incision that I made, but look at that range of motion. That's beautiful. And then I, for Steven, went all the way back. There's the two heads of the genioglossus. So for all of you guys who haven't seen the two heads of the genioglossus, there it is. Sometimes I go find them. Sometimes I stay above them. Sometimes I cut them. I cut into them and release them as well. It all depends on, on a release. And we take measurements throughout the whole entire procedure. I never leave a, a, a patient with an open wound. That would be very, very painful. That would hurt a whole lot. That would not be good healing. I always put sutures in all of my surgeries that I do. I want primary closure. Primary closure for an adult is extremely important. Look at this guy's tongue range of motion when he leaves the office. He's at 37 millimeters when he's leaving the office the day of surgery. So what is what does the pre and the post look like? If you guys are seeing this and not noticing the difference, well, we need to do some more education. So for the tongue range of motion ratio pre, he's at 41%, which is a grade three. Post functional frenuloplasty, 88%. That is a grade one, guys. There's not, there's not too much better than that. So we went from a grade three tongue tie to a grade one tongue tie. And that is the whole, um, that is the whole point of surgery. Of course, none of this would have been possible without Lauren and Maya functional therapy. So for Steven's post infranuloplasty, we don't just look, we don't just visualize and say, yay, we did a good job. Everybody let's celebrate. No, we ask the patient, how, how are they feeling? We get a new sleep study. We measure our results. We don't release things without being able to measure. What did we just do? How do we document this? What is the patient saying? So for him, we now know that through the Zagi and Camacho research out of Stanford, that with myofunctional therapy alone, we can expect a 50% reduction in AHI if we, if we couple that with a functional frenuloplasty. So what did we do here? We went from an 11.9 to a 5.2. Guess what? That's about 50, 60% reduction. We went from 222 snores to nine total. Okay. Steven states that he no longer wakes up at night. He is dreaming for the first time ever. And he wakes up feeling like he got refreshed sleep. Steven has more confidence and feels as though he is more productive at work. Um, so success, right? Success, big success. Steven is as happy as he ever could be. The only, the only, um, uh, the only reservation was that, that, I didn't recognize this earlier. He was a patient that was in my practice since day one I started. He was a patient since I came out of dental school and it took me this long to figure out what was going on with him. So, um, you know, Steven is uh, as happy as could be. He's thriving in his work. He feels better, he sleeps better, um, another life changed. And so I'm not gonna go through this case study for the, for the sake of time. I just wanna introduce you real quick to Andrew and, and show you a testimony of what someone who goes through this um, has to say. So again, Andrew came in, sleep study, you name it. As you can see, a um, little tongue tie right there, right? Maybe not one that jumps off the page, but he's also grade three. Um, Here's the procedure. You can see the stitches. You can see the sutures. You can see how much bigger he's opening now. And let's hear a little bit about what he has to say. So halfway through, so halfway through surgery, I felt like my tongue, well, I couldn't feel my tongue. I did not know what was going on with it. Um, my brain did not know what to do with it. It's completely new. I had new range of motion. I'm to the loss. This is a very different procedure. <laughs> Okay, so that was him day of surgery. So now let's hear from him, which is um, three weeks after surgery. 
say, Andrew, tell us how you feel after your procedure was done. All right, after my procedure, I actually got the best night of sleep since I was 12. To put it in perspective, I'm 37 now, so that's 25 years. Um, also, there's a lot of tension that's gone now. Um, I was grinding my teeth in my sleep. I've lost my two rear lower rollers um, over the years. I don't have any tension in my neck. I'm actually getting bigger range of motion with my neck. My arms aren't following when I turn my head, for example, as well. Getting a better range of motion than even in my jawline. Um, just in general, I'm feeling better all around. Um, there was this kind of constant agitation, I guess, from lack of sleep and from, um, you know, just all the tension here in my neck and my jaw, and that's gone now. I want to say I'm thinking clear. So, yeah, yeah it's definitely been a life-changing event having this phrenectomy. So as you can see, he had a life-changing event. We were able to completely change his life, his sleep. He even says his relationship with his wife is better. He's less irritable. Um, so there's a lot of anecdotes that we have out there like this. There's plenty of case studies that uh, we see. Um, and I just wanted to wrap up with, with this. Um, Dr. Zaghi and a lot of people around the country are, are really putting out some great research. And, you know, it's just our job to kind of follow them and, and kind of... Um, you know, stand on the shoulders of them. They're the ones that are doing all the research and I'm just learning. I'm just absorbing. I'm just soaking up as much as I possibly can. And it's just, it's so powerful to kind of understand, you know, what a missed um, diagnosis, what a, what a, um, someone who compensated their whole life. Like when you learn to look for these things, when they're babies, you can just prevent such a lifetime of, of issues. And so, you know, TOTS releases are not the end all to be all. We need to evaluate structures in, in a total complex, not individually. Tongue ties are just a piece of the total puzzle. And that's what we have to remember. Lip and tongue ties do not cause every problem, but they can make every single one of them worse. I truly do believe that. Um, the timing of the release is equally as important as getting released. Without my functional therapy, without the time that the patient spends with Lauren, Lauren has to give me the green light before I, I release a tongue. Without her, none of this would be possible. Without her, our outcomes would be less than ideal. Myofunctional therapy, myofunctional therapy, myofunctional therapy. If I haven't said it before, myofunctional therapy is the key. Dr. Green and I, not to take away from what we do, we are pieces of the puzzle as well, but we have the easy job. We get the release, we get the surgical release. Without our therapists, without the Leas of the world, without the IBCLCs of the world, without the Lawrence of the world, none of this is possible. And so here's a quote that I live by, to, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Um, so a couple of resources for you guys who wanna learn more about this stuff, tongue tied by a good um, buddy and professional colleague of mine, Dr. Richard ba Baxter out of Alabama. He runs, he, he runs Alabama Tongue Tie Clinic. Um, he put out this book and uh, we, um, we give this out to anybody, anybody, anybody who wants to learn more about this. If you're interested in, in, in more of a visual learner and you don't like reading, this is a great, great, great um, TED Talk by uh, Gerald Simmons, Jerry Simmons, uh, a guy out of um, Dallas. He talks about the neurological consequences of a misfit mouth on sleep, and it all started with a tongue tie that was not diagnosed properly. So my, um, my closing to all of you is start early, look at your kid's tongues, look at the way your kids breathe, make sure they're not breathing through their mouths, make sure they're sleeping, make sure that things are in correct order, um, we have a pediatric airway symposium coming up. Stay tuned for those dates. We'll be able to send you guys emails. Um, again, like Dr. Green said, the importance of an early diagnosis is great. My job is to put myself out of business. I deal with fires on a daily basis. Lauren and I deal with fi fires on a daily basis. Let's, let's keep Leah and let's keep Dr. Green busy. Let's keep me and Joe and, um, and Lauren less, less busy. Let's get to the smoke before there's even a fire that has, that has even remotely started. Okay. And then, so I'm going to end there for all of you guys who get great um, value out of hearing us speak and all that, please follow us. We put out a lot of great content on a daily basis. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to the panel. And I know we're here right at 10 1 PM. We made it. Um, I'm going to uh, hope, hopefully everybody's unmuted. So if, um, if we can go through some of the questions that we have, I know I'm willing to stay on as long as you guys want. Everybody who wants to log off and get a good night, night, night's worth of sleep, go ahead. But if anybody wants to stay on and chat, I'm available. I know Lauren, myself, and, uh, and Dr. Green, we are night owls. We stay up, <laughs> stay up and we like to sleep in. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's turn it over to um, some questions. So um, 
All right. So, Joanna, are you aware, um, what is the latest estimate of the percentage of babies requiring TOT intervention? This is definitely not documented. What would you, what would yeah. you say? Um, what I've read is between uh, 4 to 11% is what I have seen. Um, I was looking at some papers at some research and uh, a lot of them say 4%, but no, there's, there hasn't been any new studies new information, but I think it's increased um, also because awareness has increased. So I don't think there's an, to my knowledge, there's an accurate percentage. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. And uh, Leah, it looks like you've already answered all your, you've answered a couple of your questions. What is a burst? David asked. And David must be local because he knows our good friend, uh, Mariana Evans. Um, so we use Mariana Evans for so much orthopedic development. My wife is currently in the middle of um, expansion with her, um, the moon skeletal expander. My kids are in uh, treatment with her. So um, David, glad to have you on here. Um, let's see what other open questions can we um, talk about. So what is the technique when taking CBCT to assess airway space? Do you still use Pando method to put the tongue to the roof of the mouth? Yeah. So Lauren, you take these all day long. Can you answer that for um, Isabella? What, it, what exactly do you, do you tell a patient? Um, what was the question here? So what take what technique like so basically go through a CBCT. What do you do to to get the an accurate assessment of where the tongue actually is supposed to sit? I mean, we just have them close, swallow. Yeah. So I mean, typically, like I'll just have them do a natural bite, like just have them bite on their back teeth. Um, I'll have them swallow and then just kind of stay where they are biting on the teeth, and then that scan will be able to tell us where the placement of the tongue is. And then of course, like when I do my assessments, especially for like adults, I, with kids it's a little bit harder, but when I do my assessment, I always like in the middle to kind of throw the patient off, I'll kind of ask them like, where's your tongue hanging out? Like, where's the tip of the tongue? Where's the back of the tongue? So then most times people will be like, oh, it's hanging down low, or it's only the tip of the tongue's at the roof of the mouth. So that's also another good Thing to kind of throw the patient off and ask them when you're in middle conversation kind of where their tongue is resting yeah and, and lauren on that topic i can say to everybody that's on here um how many times lauren do we look at cbct and we look at the tongue position on cbct and we're like oh my goodness did we miss a tongue tie did we miss a posterior mm -hmm. tongue tie because a lot of times the patients will trick us and they'll be able to get that the anterior portion of their tongue the the, yeah, the the anterior third of the tongue up and then we see the posterior um, part of the tongue sitting down and then we do we lift look under the hood and do more of a investigative kind of examination we find that you know um, the patient was, was tricking us they were using all, all these muscles you know in the neck to be able to stretch that up there and so without a proper assessment we miss we miss a lot of this stuff and so we're getting better and so cbct although not um a, um, although not a diagnostic tool can give us a lot more information. Um, so, uh, Isabella says, uh, I'm sorry. Um, what is, what if the patient is under anesthesia having an adenoidectomy as well? Um, so if a, yeah, I mean, I think it's all about the provider, uh, Nicole. I mean, if you're like, if you, like, if you were going over to in Los Angeles and seeing Dr. Zaghi and he was going to do do an adenoidectomy or a tonsillectomy or something. Yeah. You're going to want him to release your kid's tongue. Um, if they're under three years old, um, no doubt about it, but just make sure you're going to the right provider. A lot of, um, ENTs in our area, unfortunately are still using scissors. Um, a lot of ENTs in our area really aren't understanding of the, of the, um, uh, what a full release is and, and the, and basically the, the process that's available. There aren't too many, there aren't really anybody around here that, that does it. Um, so you, you just want to make sure that you vet your providers is what I can say. Make sure that they know what a tongue tie um, release should look like and what providers to work with. Again, if you're not seeing a Leah or an IBCLC beforehand for your baby um, or for your little child, then that's probably a problem. I would never let an ENT just go in there and do a release without seeing um, uh, a, a therapist first and after. Um, now, if your patient's older than two years old, then definitely, definitely, definitely don't let that ENT do a tongue tie release without um, uh, uh, with the adenoidectomy because you won't get a functional, you won't get a functional product there. Um, like I said, we, we grade the range of motion while we're doing surgery. So whether it's a four-year-old that, you know, we're doing with the laser or whether it's a six-year-old who could tolerate my method, the functional frangioplasty, we are getting a, a functional assessment of what's going on with the tongue when we release it. 
Um, so how will you assess range of motion um, post-op? Uh, we measure. We just measure it. We measure it with the, the quick tongue tie tool that we showed on those cases. Um, so before, during the procedure, right after the procedure, after the sutures go in, after Joanna um, would do a four-year-old stung, like we're going to measure. We're going to see, you know, how much range of motion is there. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to follow up with them. They're going to see Lauren um, a couple days after surgery. They're going to see Lauren uh, a week after surgery. They're going to see Lauren two weeks after surgery and so on and so forth. So we're going to continue to grade each um, appointment and see kind of um, making sure that we get that, um, that full range of motion that we're looking for. Um, so what is the best way to test for a tongue thrust? Lauren, I'm going to, I'm going to let you and uh, Leah answer that, answer that. So what is the best way to test for a tongue thrust? Yeah. Well, I would say like for yourself, I think that it's great to like take a sip of water, look in the mirror, obviously, and hold that water, like don't swallow it and then take your cheeks and pull them out and then see like what your tongue is doing in there and all these extra muscles here. So typically when we swallow, the tongue should go up and back like a wave. We shouldn't see the tongue thrusting forward like through the teeth. We shouldn't see any saliva, any water coming forward. We don't want to see any of the cheeks coming forward, the lips, the talus, the chin muscle, anything coming up. So we don't want to see any of these muscles here used just the tongue. So I would say that's a great one to do like at home in front of the mirror, like checking that if you're curious about yourself. Um, and then if it's a patient in the dental chair, you can always do that just using the air water syringe and kind of doing the same technique. Leah, do you have anything more to add to that? No, that's exactly how I test for a tongue thrust. Cool. Um, so Lauren, I think this is for you. Kim says, what does the patient demonstrate with their OFM to Lauren? For you to release the tissue, what does the patient demonstrate with their, what's OFM? I'm not sure. Anybody? Oral, oral facial myologist? That's what I was oh. thinking too. I'm like, maybe that's what that means. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Lauren. Yeah. So I would say like, you know, obviously like we do use the QTT. That's just like a quick tongue tie assessment, kind of just like a red flag almost. But, you know, I always assess the function of the tongue. So Typically, we do a thorough medical history, going over digestive issues, you know, their feeding, just different things, the swallowing, kind of just getting a full medical history on the patient. You know, is there a history of tongue ties in the family? And then as far as doing the functional test, just really seeing how the tongue moves and, you know, do they have to use compensation in their jaw, their lips, their cheeks, their neck? Um, you know, can they reach their tongue up to their molars? Can they... Um, and even doing, I know Leah, like we, when we like are working together, even doing, having the patient like doing a click noise too. I mean, a lot of people have a really hard time getting that posterior tongue to the roof of their mouth when they're just doing clicks or doing that suction and hold to the roof of the mouth. So really just kind of assessing how the tongue is moving and making sure they're not using any other muscles. We should just be moving the tongue and not the jaw or anything else. Yeah, so co correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that you always look for, Lauren, is um, is the tongue quivering? So Lauren will have them do these like little exercises. If the tongue is still quivering, we're, the, the strength is not there. The, the, yeah. Like Lauren needs to do more strengthening exercises in order for them to be ready for me because these, okay. these releases that I do take, take 30 minutes um, at least. So if they can't demonstrate proficiency with strength, no, no way I'm going to release them. So I get mad at, I get mad at Lauren and um, my, my functional therapist, because if, if Lauren gives the patient a green light and sends them to me and in the middle of the procedure, they can't hold a, a cave, a lingual palatal suction like that for two minutes, then I'm looking at Lauren looking at, I mean, part of my and friends. It doesn't like, happen like, often. Like, no, no, it, it doesn't happen hardly. It doesn't happen hardly, <laughs> hardly ever. ever. <laughs> it doesn't happen hardly ever with you. Uh, but when we were first getting started, I was like, this patient's not ready for surgery. They, they, don't, they don't demonstrate proficiency, enough strength to be able to sit through a procedure like mine. And so they got to go back to the my functional therapist for more therapy before they're ready for a release. We really only want to cut one time. Joanna and I do not want to go in there and slice, 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 dice, come back a month later, do it again. We want our one time in, one time out. 
and we want to make it as easy and proficient as possible. And with a good myofunctional therapist, that is absolutely possible. So thankfully, we have Lauren and Leah who set us up pretty well. They like they make me and Joanna look good, you know, <laughs> um, right, Joanna? That's true. It's all it's all about the team. That's right. So when would a laser not be used for a phrenectomy? I would say a laser would not be used for a phrenectomy if a patient is able to sit through surgery, period. Would, it, would you agree, Joanna? Yeah, I mean, laser, the laser does a great job of coagulating. We have very little bleeding. It's a very clean site. Um, but I think what this question is aiming at is... Um, your like what you're doing with the functional frenoplasty, right? Like you don't use a laser for that because you can be much more precise with scissors and you're having the patient um, do certain things with their tongue and hold the cave and you go in and you dissect muscles. So maybe you do the initial the initial um, cut with this with the laser, but you're going in dissecting fascia, um, dissecting muscle strands with scissors but you're not getting a lot of bleeding because everything is so toned, right? Uh, yeah, exactly right. Right. Um, so the, so the fr to further that, just to kind of um, uh, throw some examples at you. So if a, if, a, if a patient is five years old and they're not very good and we just have already, we've already done a preoperative assessment and we're just like, there's no way this patient's going to be able to sit through a functional frenuloplasty with, with scissors and sutures. And I, I'm not really cutting when I'm doing my frenuloplasty. I'm more so just plucking apart the, the, the fascia and the fibers. And so I'm, it's a very slow kind of pluck apart. I'm not, I'm not chop, 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 chopping. I'm plucking apart the fibers. And during surgery, I'm having the patient swallow and go through all their myofunctional therapy techniques that Lauren has taught them. And the tongue is literally just releasing back for me. One of the coolest things is to look under the tongue. And all I have to do is just take a little Q-tip and I just pluck the, the fibers and they just, they just snap back and the tongue is like literally releasing before your eyes, which is the coolest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to use a, a, a laser for that. That would be counterproductive. But for instance, say you got that five-year-old that you know, we know that there's a tongue tie that's been missed and we know that it's causing behavior issues. We know that it's causing sleep issues. We know that it's causing mouth breathing. We know the kid can't possibly learn properly because they have this, this issue, this structural issue in their mouth. We're not going to not release them. We're going to send, Joanne is going to come in with a laser and release that, that five-year-old. And at the very least, we'll have the procedure done now. Is it, it would it be ideal if he could sit, if that, that patient could sit through a functional friendly, frenuplasty? Yes, but we have to adapt to what's in front of us. We have to adapt to our patients that are sitting directly in front of us, and we have to make sure that we have done all that pre-op homework and assessment in order to make the, the be make, pull out the best tool for therapy. Right, and I think, and just um, to add to that, um, Lauren's doing myofunctional therapy on our kids that are three years and older. I mean, it really depends on the child um, and their personality, but that's, that is her job is to... Um, do the assessment and work with these kids to get them ready. And uh, most of them, I mean, depending on the age, they will, will use a laser because it's so fast. Um, but they still have therapy before and therapy after that makes it as successful as it can possibly be. So. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so what is the disadvantage of using a laser instead of a scalpel? Um, Joanna, do you want to touch on that or you may go into that? Um, so I think that, I think that's probably aimed more so at what you are doing. Um, yeah, I and I think that just, it goes back to, um, it's just too invasive for what you're doing. Um, uh, the scalpel for an infant, we don't, we don't use that or a scalpel or, or scissors. Um, some people do, but you don't have any coagulation with that. Um, and typically you have a lot, um, you, you, you'll have good outcomes, but you'll have bad experiences from the patient, um, post-op pain, and the, the parents, because you should have a lot of bleeding. Um, so the laser is, is it has a very, um, it coagulates, has a very uh, small zone of like necrosis. So you have really nice healing, um, and it depends on the laser itself. So if you're using a diode, 
which is a hot laser versus uh, CO2 or erbium laser, different types of lasers will do uh, different things to the tissue. So that is, uh, and, and also the provider because the lasers don't just come with one button where you turn it on and off, but it has to do with um, the watts and the hertz and uh, wavelengths and, and different, there's different things that you adjust based on the tissue type that you're dealing with. So, um, but in general, lasers for babies and non-cooperative kids, um, scalpel or scissors for what Ryan's doing. Yeah, so I, I don't know if you guys can see my screen, hopefully you can, but I pulled it up. Um, this is the difference between laser and, and scissors and sutures. So a laser obviously is much easier. It's very quick. Um, you only need topical anesthesia for the most part. There's less risk of bleeding, uh, but it, it really is a mucosal release only. I would never, ever, ever take a laser into the genioglossus muscle. I would never do that. And then you can see, you know, when you use a laser, it's healing with secondary intention. Over here on the right, you can see with scissors and sutures, it requires more of a technical skill. It's going to take more time, more time up to 45 minutes. Like I said, it requires an injection. I mean, this, if you didn't have an injection with um, anesthesia underneath the tongue, this would be very painful. Obviously, as Joanna touched on, it's more precise, it's more complete. It allows me to literally dissect out to the very uh, fiber of what I want to release and what I don't want to release. Um, and I think, I think the biggest kind of uh, advantage to the, to the scissors and sutures, if done right, is the, is the healing that's involved. Um, so that's just my particular um, preference. So... How would I then evaluate the range of motion if he was under, how would I then evaluate the range of motion? <clears throat> are, you, are you guys talking about this? I think she's talking about the, if they're under general anesthesia with tonsils, right? Yeah, if, so that you can't, yeah, if, if you're under general anesthesia, there's no way to evaluate range of motion. There's no way. I mean, just can't do it. You just got to cross your fingers and um, get them to your, get them. You're the myofunctional therapist. Um, so, man, if you're the myofunctional therapist, I mean, you're you're ninety eight percent of of success. I mean, so all you have to do is find a provider, you know, like Dr. Green in your area is all you have to do. I mean, that should not be that should not be tough. Um, yeah, don't do it under general anesthesia. Um, all right, that makes sense. All right, so Esther says, first patient in your slide, what was the difference in time between his two sleep studies? I think it was like eight months. I'm not sure. I don't know if you remember, Lauren. I think it was like eight months. Um, we initially did a sleep study. He kind of uh, was back and forth. We talked to him about all these options, and he was 28 and really needed a lot of guidance. Um, so I think what we did was the myofunctional therapy for, you know, I think it was eight weeks or nine weeks did the release, did a myofunctional therapy for like another. I mean, he, you obviously saw all the issues that this kid presented with. Um, so we worked with him with myofunctional therapy for a while and the tongue release was just right in the middle of it. So I'd say it was about nine months. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, Phyllis says, is tongue range of motion ratio done with a tongue click or tongue to the to spot? So it's done with tongue to spot. Um, so uh, we, do, we do tongue range of motion is maximum opening, um, maximum opening with um, tongue to the spot. And then we do a third one where, where the patient does a, um, a lingual um, palatal suction or what we call a cave, where we go like that, we measure that as well. Um, so yeah, any more questions, guys? I think we've any other ones. We're good, right? Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. All right. Well, last 20 seconds to ask a question. Otherwise, we are gonna retire for the night. <laughs> maybe maybe. Um, all right, cool guys. Th um, here's a question. Do you have an, any anyone in New York that you recommend that practices with the same methods? Um, New York? Oh my goodness, there's got to be people in New York that do this stuff, right? I mean, there's got to be a ton of people in, in New York. Um, yeah, so um, so Nicole, um, hit us up on the side. Um, you have our email addresses. 
um, hit us up on the side. There's we're, we will be able to help you out. We can find someone in, in, um, North of New York city. No, no, no doubt about it. I mean, maybe do some Google, uh, maybe go on the Dr. Google and just make sure that, um, he, he can find some people for you. And then you uh, know, maybe a, a Zoggy, um, a breathe Institute ambassador, yeah, yeah, their yeah. website. Yeah. That's a great, great, good, good stuff, Joanna. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody said, thank you. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, it was truly an honor to present with you again, Joanna, um, Leah for the yeah. first time. We'll, we'll do many more of these. Yeah. Laura, it's always, uh, I'm, um, it's always an honor presenting with you. So hopefully everybody got a lot of value out of this. Um, I certainly had a good time and learned a lot. I always do from hearing from you, um, most talented and compassionate uh, uh, ladies here. And um, everybody, please sign up for Thursday night, 8 p.m. Lauren is going to be talking about the power of uh, proper breathing. She is going to be talking about butico breathing. She is going to be talking about the oxygen advantage. So any of you guys who want to get that oxygen advantage and want to find um, you know, little things that can improve your programs that can help your patients that can help yourselves, your family members. I mean, you name it. Um, we can, we can help. So I'm, I'm excited for that lecture. And then, um, just as a sneak peek, we're probably going to roll out a whole nother series of lectures after all this stuff is done. We're going to let it kind of, um, uh, simmer for a little bit and then we're back to educating as we always do. So stay tuned guys, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, um, check into our YouTube pages and uh, we'll keep you posted. All right. So everybody have a good night and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Right. Thank you everyone. Good night.